this is kind of like a little bit out of the realm of what I wanted to get into, but I just wanted to demonstrate, um, you know, I've been showing a lot of my code or the product of my code, which is these like web pages. Um, but I haven't exactly been showing where I build my code, where I'm writing it. So I wanted to give a little peek. So this is a terminal. Um, I think everyone in this room is probably familiar with it, but for anyone watching the recording, maybe back. Um, terminal is a very simple interface into your computer, using your computer. Um, it exposes a lot of tools um, that are more like utilities. And it lets us kind of like navigate and walk around our computer without using a, it's called a GUI, like so using the mouse to click around a graphical user interface. Um, terminal's kind of a precursor of the GUI. It's like how everyone used to navigate a computer, but now we don't really need that. So anyway, um, the, so what I mean, is, the, is the terminal the same for all operating systems or is the Mac terminal different from the Windows terminal? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the terminal in this case for which I'm using OS X, like the, the Mac and uh, operating system. And, and the terminal describes the application here, which, yeah, is going to be different from Windows. But within the terminal is also a shell, what's called a shell, which is also unique to an operating system. In this case, the shell is called Bash, B-A-S-H. You can, can look in, into that if you're interested. Um, and it's a type of environment that you work within that provides a set of utilities specific to that shell. The Windows shell is different. Um, I don't actually remember what it's called. I think it's just called like CMD or something like that. But it also provides its own set of utilities which are different, but most of them do the same things. Um, there's like equivalencies. So like this bash shell, for instance, I'm going to type CD. CD is going to take me to a directory. So that's like the objective of CD. So if I press LS here, it's going to list all of the options here that I can that I can look at within this directory. The directory is specified here. So it says, you know, this is like my MacBook and it's saying I'm in this directory agent based models. So if I press LS, I can see what's in the directory. Um, I don't have any nice highlighting here. You can usually do that for a terminal, but I happen to know that resources is a, another directory within this one. Um, and SRC is another one. So I can say CD resources and I just press tab. It'll complete the full name for me. And I press enter and now I'm in resources. If I press LS, um, it shows me the contents within that. And if I CD and press dot dot, that's like a keyword, it'll take me back up. So if I press LS again, I'm like back at where it was before. Um, in Windows, this would be like DIR. You'd say dir and then go wherever you want to go. So yeah, that's, that's a good thing to articulate. They, they are different, but um, you can actually use the bash shell on Windows if you want. So um, yeah. but. Uh, the main thing I wanted to demonstrate here, that's not super important, but it's, it is, it's interesting stuff to know. Um, Can I ask a quick question about this? Yeah, yeah, uh, there's so like there, it, when you're interacting with the terminal, is there like a name for this kind of syntax or this kind of, uh, this kind of, I mean, it's almost like you're, you're still, you're using a lang uh, kind of an idiosyncratic language yeah. within the terminal itself. What is Absolutely. It? Is there a name for it or? Yeah, yeah, that's actually, the name would be Bash. Yeah, it's, it's, it depends on your shell. Um, I think maybe there are some shells out there which like um, have what different. What do you mean by shell? What do you, can you elaborate? Yeah, on? yeah, I know it's kind of a weird term. Okay, so basically when I say shell, I'm trying to distinguish from like, uh, and let me share my screen to make it like even clearer. I'll share my full desktop, okay. Because I realize I'm only showing you the app, so it's like kind of unclear. Okay, so like, you know, I have all these other applications here. I'm 
kind of browsing through them. So this application that I'm holding right here, uh, like that I'm moving around, this is the terminal application. But if you see, notice here, there's like this shell dropdown. So the shell is kind of like the terminal application is hosting a shell. And a shell is like, it's kind of like an instance of the use of like an environment. It's, it's a little, it's a little sort of bizarre, but it's, it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like, um, uh, you, you can, in a weird way, kind of think of it like a television channel, like the terminal is like um, the television, like the actual television set. Um, and then that hosts many channels. So the shell would be like a channel. Um, that's sort of a bad example because you can have many shells at once happening simultaneously. So I can press new window here or even a new tab. Um, so within this terminal application, I'm now hosting another shell. Note that it says here, um, if this thing, I'm gonna try to, I guess it's fine, it went away. Notice here how it says bash. So this is like the shell variant. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's kind of a weird uh, nomenclature, but it's, yeah, it's kind of like an instance, if, if that makes sense, like an instance. Um, and then the term, yeah, the terminal is just like the app, like the application that you download. There are many terminal applications. I can download all kinds of different ones that let you do different things. Like they might organize sh the shells, the shell instances differently on the page, maybe would let me tab them differently or have different colors. Um, but uh, to answer, to go back up one, to talk about the language. Um, so I am actually using bash. The, that that is the language um, that that I'm like making use of here. Um, Bash is kind of a, like a scripting language, um, but um, yeah, typically you'll see it referred to as like a bat. I'm in a Bash set sh Bash shell, and in a Bash shell, I can write Bash Bash scripts. So like scripts that are written using Bash. Um, and since we have, I think you can both see this browser, right? Yes. Okay. Um, I can. I can just. We can. We can just take a look at one. Um, I don't trust any of these websites. Let's just like look at someone maybe asking a question about. Oh, great. Okay. So here's like a whole category for Bash questions, Bash related questions. Um, so we can take a look. Oh, this is great. So this is like a really basic example of some bash, some bash code. Um, so you can see it kind of follows the same format. Like you can imagine I could replace it with like the CD that I showed you before. Um, but basically it's like typically in sort of like a command scheme. And each of these commands takes like parameters. Um, it, it is pretty uh, like a unique language. It's um, in a family of sort of these scripted like environment languages. But yeah, this is Bash. It's it's just something you can learn. It's it's a primarily a script utility. Um, it lets you access a lot of like operating system features. This here, for example, PID is referring to like a process ID. So it's saying like, give me the current process ID. Um, or it, I think actually it's making a new process and then giving it an ID. But like, if you've ever looked at like something like this, this is the PID. That's, this is the same thing it's referring to right here. So it lets you do a lot of stuff like that. You can access like operating system sort of. So can um, I ask a question? Yeah, sure, sure. So do all shells, um, they're just, no matter the type of shell, I'm finding different ways of interacting with like my, my uh, computer hardware? Is that the nature of every kind of shell or? 
Yeah, I think it's a little more abstracted than that. Like the oh, okay. layer, yeah, the layer that you're operating at is more the operating system, which is- Oh, right, okay. Yeah, and the operating system sits a bit above that in like, if you can imagine this sort of like abstraction hierarchy, um, you have some things in between there. Um, but these different um, mm -hmm. shell languages, mm -hmm. They they all interact with the the operating system, but in slightly different ways. Or yeah, can I mean, I can uh, I treat them all kind of similarly? Yeah, I, you totally yeah. can. I mean, the reason for a distinction between shells is largely because of the way that, like, you know, the the differences that you might have with operating systems. But 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 certainly architecture also comes into it. Like even like processor architecture, maybe to some degree, but um for the most part yeah it's 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 distinguished the distinguishing operating system is kind of what leads to or lends to like a different bat like a different shell um that got created like you know basically they made they started working on windows and they were like we need a shell basically a way for people to interface with the operating system um mm -hmm outside of like the application layer. So like, like if, if, if I build an application, I don't have to use a shell because at the application layer, I'm writing code that interfaces with the operating system in the same manner that the shell would. So the shell allows like the user to do that. Um, whereas an application would skip the shell because you would just write your application. But gotcha. um, yeah, so like when they were developing Linux, um the bash shell came up early on um osx is you may have heard like a unix based operating system you may have heard that before so that means it kind of has the same ancestor as linux uh linux linux operating system um whereas windows does not windows is not unix based so that means it kind of did have to have a completely different, but it, it, I mean, the same kind of utilities apply. And again, they have, you can use a bash cell on windows. What it does is it just has to have something happening in the background that does kind of like a translation scheme for you. So it like figures out like, oh, okay. If they, if they're saying this in bash, what they really mean in windows is like this. Gotcha. Um, so, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, no, no problem. Um, so, uh, and that, that stuff is really uh, interesting to get into as well um, for um, particularly like, um, trying to think of like some good examples but I mean in this example this is kind of an interesting one it looks like this person wants to yeah like basically have a particular operating system function happen like every um every you know n seconds or whatever uh the sleep one here is saying I believe sleep for one second yeah one second um so they're, what they're doing right now is like making something happen every one second and they're having it happen 10 times. So one through 10, you don't have to know like why that means, it. I mean, it's not really important, but um, you can write scripts like this on your computer and then you can have them do all kinds of things like, um, again, it's kind of weird because mostly we just use applications for this, but you know, back in the, um, I don't know, the early days, like the early aughts of operating systems, you didn't have like the suite of applications available to you that we kind of do now, like where you, we just have this wealth of applications and these utilities that have graphical user interfaces and stuff. So we just are more inclined to like use something like that. But back then, like if you wanted something to like, I don't know, like make something like this didn't exist, like this, Finder to let me browse my files. So if you wanted something to like quickly sort all of the files in this folder and 
print them out to me in alphabetical order and tell me which ones have files in them. Like you could just write a utility to do that in like this bash scripting environment. Um, yeah, I know we've spent a good bit of time on this. I don't mean to like harp it too much, but it is kind of cool. Um, so the one thing I just wanted to show you is like basically where I'm building my code for the example page, which I, I know I've uh, kind of introduced before. It's, it's, this is the project site. Um, and uh, if you click this link, you can visit that project site um, or I've posted a, a set of links. And what I was about to do actually, um, you see I made an update 19 minutes ago um, to this remote hosting site for my code. But I was actually gonna make another update to include a new link. So um, I'm using this tool Git, and I'm not really gonna go too deep into it, because again, it's like, uh, there are plenty of very good tutorials that can give you better descriptions than I can, but um, I just wanted to show you the process that I go through, which kind of looks like this. So I made a modification to the file, and the way I do that is I use this text editor, it's called Vim. Um, so this is what the file looks like. This is an HTML file. It's very simple. We talked a little bit about some of this kind of stuff last week. You can see some hyperlinks here. And so I added this one, this new hyperlink, to this sample page that I recently added to the site. And I added this page break, this BR. So I'm going to save that. You can see at the bottom here it says like 24... 294 characters written or whatever, it's, so it's saved. So I'm gonna quit and I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna do this thing called git status, which is, I'm talking to my version control software and asking it to give me a status of the files as they are currently relative to the uh, state of the remote repository. So like the code and the files that are sitting here. And it's saying, oh, like you've modified this file, like this file isn't here online. So then what I'm going to do is I'm going to add this file to the stage. Uh, oh. um, yes, I do. I just shared it, so it kind of defeated the purpose. Uh, one second. Okay, um, yeah, so if I add this um, to, if I add this to um, my, it's called a staging area. So it's basically saying like, I'm about to modify this file, like not permanently, but like, um, I, I'm going to send it off to the repository. Basically, it's not super important, but uh, so I'm going to copy the name of the file. I'm going to paste it here. So I'm saying git, which again is the application software, add, and then like the name of the file. I'm going to click that. In status again, you'll see it's now green. So it's saying like it's ready to go. Um, so now I'm going to what's called uh, commit which is basically saying like, hey, um, you know, finalize the change and send it off. So I can also include a message here. So I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna say, um, add a new link to the homepage. Okay, so it said one file changed four insertions. So that means like I changed four lines. So I'm gonna do a status again, and it's gonna say, hey, like, you're actually ready to go and push this branch off to the main branch. Um, like uh, your local branch is ahead by one commit, meaning like you have one more change than there is on the website or like the online hosted repository. So I'm gonna go ahead and push it off. And it's done. So you can see the URL here too. It says github.com, page Swanson, agent-based models. And if you look at that, it's the same URL. So it's kind of cool. We can refresh. And right here, this is one minute ago, I added a new link. So um, 
anyway, that, that's how I make my changes. Um, all of it is done via this terminal. That's like the way I do things. Um, by the way, this file, is that looked confusing? It's just a file that the Mac operating system adds whenever you view a directory. I, I don't know why it adds them, or I do know why it adds them. It adds them, it adds them to like, store the representation of like these little icons and stuff and like the order of the files. And everything. But th basically they're unimportant. So we can use another bash utility, which is part of the shell and we can remove it. And now it's gone. There's nothing here. So it says your branch is up to date. So my computer, the files that are on my computer are the same as the files that are on the remote server where I'm hosting the code. So now, with pages, if you uh, remember here, so if you see this, this is like the website that I'm hosting with this project, the code in this project. Um, so it hasn't updated yet with the link I added. Um, so I'm gonna refresh this page and I'm gonna try it one more time. There it goes. So now we have our new link um, and we can click it. And this is like intense, but this is the sample page I built that we'll get to in a second. So I don't want to get too into that yet. I have some stuff, some material I kind of want to go through. So I'm going to take you through that first. Um, okay, so we, we can kind of dive into that. So do, do you, anyone have any questions? I don't. I know that wasn't, it was kind of a sidetrack. So I don't know if that was like helpful or if it meant. So, so you're able to interact with GitHub directly through the terminal. Or like you were able to post the, that new link via the GitHub. Um, yeah, yeah, I was able to, um, connect to a remote server. Um, and in that case, what I'm doing is I'm kind of hosting the Git application, but I'm like interfacing with that application through the shell that we talked about. So um, they do make what are called GUIs. Cool. Yeah. So you, can, so you can interface with other things through the terminal as well. Yeah, totally, 100%. You can run all kinds of things. Um, there's applications, to plenty of applications that are just like dedicated to uh, use with the terminal. Um, and so like most co coding is done within the terminal. Um, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Um, I wouldn't say that. I mean, uh, I think a lot, in fact, most people prefer not to do what I'm doing here, which is like, like for instance, these are my notes. So I'm writing my notes in the terminal. And uh, I do that because the text editor that I use, I'm just like very used to it. So it's like fast for me to use. Um, but um, there are plenty of code editors that are much easier to use and much more, perf not necessarily performant. I mean, the advantage of this is it's certainly very lightweight, which is really nice. Like, it's very fast. Um, but uh, I would say it's not like intuitive. So one that I'd highly recommend, um, if any of you are planning to write some code on your own, check out Sublime Text. It's like a very great editor. You can see it's a lot different already. Uh, it's got this nice folder view and uh, it does all this kind of cool, very nice looking highlighting, which mine does that too, but I would say um, it's a bit easier to work with here. It has search and so is it, there, there's a lot like more advanced ones. Uh, Vim, the one that I'm using Vim was made a long, a long time ago, like, I don't even, I think in the 90s, early 90s or something, then was like uh, uh, set up. So there's a lot more options out there now and I would highly recommend, I, I would seek those out 
primarily because you're going to be able to get a lot more mileage out of them starting out. And Sublime Text is a really great one. I highly recommend it. It's um, free. Um, it's free to use. Um, another one is called Atom. It's a great one too. Um, these are both um, editors that are very um, transparent in how they're created and like designed. So that's pretty cool. Um, for instance, the code for Atom is open source. Um, yeah. So you can click this fork on GitHub and it takes us to the GitHub repository similar to my GitHub repository. Uh, this is like the source code for the editor. So that's kind of cool. It's like an open source application. But Atom is like pretty advanced. I would say um, it's easy to use, but like Sublime is definitely more lightweight. So highly recommend checking something out like that. There's also uh, Notepad++, which is really a, a super simple one. Um, I like this one a lot too. It's very well made. It's like very lightweight. Um, and I think this one is just for Windows. Yeah, it's just for Windows. So if you're using Windows, this is a great one. Um, so do all these text editors, um, ultimately their purpose is to interact with the terminal? Um, the text editors that I showed you, they're graphical. They have um, like very well fleshed out graphical user interfaces. So maybe I can demonstrate with an example, because I think I have one. Yeah, text edit. It's like a really everything you were, you were just typing to get all that stuff onto the GitHub was mm -hmm. all done in the terminal, right? That's correct. Yeah, totally. So did, were, was a text editor involved? I kind of got, got lost. Oh, yeah, it. sure. Um, I did use a text editor briefly, and I can show you exactly where I did that. So let me save this really quick. So I just saved that file. It doesn't really matter how, because that's specific to that text editor, but it's not super important. So I'm going to jump back to the location. And you see, I'm just, this is most of what I'm using the, these commands for is just ones that I've already covered. They're basic commands. This is the ones I use most of the time. So CD change directory. So I'm going to go to my documents folder and dev. And I happen to know that my Git, the project that I'm tracking with Git is in here it's called agent based models. So I'm going to do an LS, which just means list. So list all the files and stuff. So right now I'm using the, sh like I'm, I'm using the terminal, which, and to, I guess to clarify that the terminal is an application that hosts shells. It basically can be used for um, really any like console type of application. Um, it doesn't have to just be a shell. Um, I could write a program. Uh, did you ever see those like, I don't know. Um, I don't know if you've ever played like a console game or something like you might download a console based game that like only uses very simple like ASCII characters or something like that. Um, Maybe. But in that case, like, like asteroids or something. Yeah, or yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. And, and okay. maybe that could be implemented in a way where um, you know, it, it opens up the console or the terminal. So it's using an instance of the terminal application to host uh, a separate like application um, applications like output, like, um, the application we're interested in for our case, for example, was Git because that's what I'm using to modify or to um, track my code changes. 
Um, that application provides all of its like throughputs um, with the through through the terminal using the terminal. Um, so this git here, if I click git, it's like it prints out all this stuff because if you don't tell git what to do, it it doesn't know what to do. So it just gives you some options for what you can do with it. But it's telling you here like, oh, you could tell me to uh, provide my version, for example. So we could try that. You can copy this. I think it didn't actually copy. Let's see. So I, I can use this here. So I can say git and I can pass the version. And it gives me the version here. It says 2.2 .2, Apple, whatever. So what's happening right now is like I am inside of the terminal application and I'm interacting with via the shell like another application. And so this I'm is on like, the internet. I'm sorry? So this is on the internet though? Oh no, like, not yeah, not, not, not yet. this. Yeah, this okay. is still local. Yeah. Right. Okay. Where it gets to the internet is just one part like one part and one part only. So I'll kind of walk through it actually again to clarify which part is actually networked. Okay. So what right now what I'm about to do is open a text editor. I'm going to use the terminal to do that. But when I make the like command, I'm actually referencing a text editor application which the terminal hosts. Now okay. funnily enough, what I can do is like actually use I can't I don't think I can use text edit from the terminal but like are you still within git as you No, not anymore yeah what okay. like git in okay. this case sometimes uh, as as uh, like you're kind of suggesting or that does suggest sometimes the the application kind of like persists like in the background um, we can kind of prove that um, it might be running right now, uh, just kind of sitting around, but I don't think it is. But in some cases, it kind of will um, run in the background. But I think it's not for our operations. Um, there's some cases where it might do that. For the most part, though, Git's going to like basically do the thing you requested it do and then stop. So like if I do a git status, it thinks for like a very brief second and then tells me the status and then it's like done. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna prompt a change, which will allow me to like make a a change to the remote, uh, like the, the online host for my files. So I'm gonna invoke another application in the terminal the text editor that I use. It's called Vim, V-I-M. So I'm going to say Vim, and then I'm going to tab, and it's going to show me like what options I have to uh, like use this text editor on. So like only some of these are files. Um, again, I happen to know which ones are. It's really like there's no sim there's no nice like coloring or sim sort of symbolic stuff happening other than these dashes to show me which things are folders. All right, not dashes, sorry, slashes. Um, so this SRC is a folder because it has a slash after it. Um, so I'm gonna edit a file and then in particular it's index.html. Um, I'm gonna click enter. Okay, so you'll see like, you can ignore this. This is just a bunch of errors related to the text editor. I just didn't configure it correctly. Um, but when I press enter, it's gonna enter like a different looking view. Okay, this is like, I'm in text editor. I'm in the text editor application now. That you access through the terminal. That's okay. correct, yeah. Right, gotcha. The terminal though, do you see this? It still says terminal as like my context. So I'm still in the terminal. I'm just like running an app, a, a separate application in this uh, instance of the, uh, the terminal. You can kind of think of it, maybe the better way to say like the, the TV analogy I made earlier was kind of bad. Uh, I think the best way to say it is actually if you just think of it like your computer, 
your computer can run like multiple applications at once, but you're like running those applications with your computer. So it like seems the, like the, the terminal, so like you, there's the graphic user interface, the GUI, but then yeah. the terminal is like a text user interface. Yeah. Right? Or it's like a, so it's like a TUI. So rather than using your mouse or using icons and stuff, it's just text and code to, to interface or engage with, with the computing rather than graphic. Yeah, that's a really good way to put it. And um, that's, that's very much, that's, I think that pretty much lines up, yeah, with like all of those sort of use cases that I can think of too. That, that's like a really great way to put it. Um, uh, yeah, your, your, your graphical user interface, especially, we don't often think of it this way, but there are sessions for the graphical user interface. Um, like there's a session going on right now for all of these windows. Like there's a session in the background that says like, I am the GUI session and I'm hosting all of these applications with their windows um, and their views and everything like that. So the same thing goes for the terminal. The terminal can host individual applications within a terminal session. Um, yeah, that's a great way to put it. It's just like, it's just like the GUI, except I don't have um, like a mouse. Um, well, I, I kind of do. I mean, I can still do this stuff, but um, for the most part, it's I'm I'm making things happen with text. Yeah. So right so, now, I'm in a text editor. So to add I, on to that, I mm -hmm. I could technically just go to the folder and open up Vim without yes. doing it through the terminal. Yes, and I can um, by using the graphic user interface. Totally, and okay. let me you know, let me just do that really quick to like be clear. So like this, in fact, Vim is kind of cool because it leaves these like really annoying files to behind whenever it opens one. So you'll be able to see. Um, I think. Oh, it's it's a hidden file actually. <laughs> so I can't show you it. Um, but so that's maybe another reason I have to use, or it's convenient to use terminal, I guess, to access hidden stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, there's a setting here um, for the. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's there's a setting I can totally toggle. I just don't know, like what the setting is. I've never thought about enabling it. But yeah, there there is a setting to let you view hidden files. I have no idea what that setting is in uh, OS X, but it's probably in preferences here. But yeah, totally. So this is the same file I'm editing right now. So I can, in fact, this is one way to do it. So check this out. I'm going to click save. I'm not going to click save. This is terminal. So I'm going to type the command at the bottom left here, W, right. So it's saving. And if you'll notice, check this out. It says now 716. So it's like they're in sync. I am, in fact, modifying this file. Um, with this text editor. Um, and then I can just open this with, now I don't have like a way to actually open Vim using the graphical user interface. But you can get a graphical user interface version of Vim actually, but, but I'll just use text edit. And so I can open text edit. And text edit actually has a feature to let us um, basically like view files of uh, you like the um, the result of the HTML if that makes sense so like the reason it looks like this is because text edit is trying to show us like the actual like HTML uh, like the result of it what it would look like on the page um, I actually find that really obnoxious and I've never I don't use this text editor so I don't know like why it does that it's kind of annoying because I just want to modify the HTML um, so there's editor. There's definitely better editors um, to do to like not do this. I don't. I I don't know why it does this. Um, it's really annoying. And I don't know how to make it stop. 
So, so I, we should shop around for whatever yes. fits our yeah. purposes. Yeah. Sublime is a very good one. I would just like bar none recommend Sublime. I can't okay. recommend it highly enough. It's very good. It's very easy to use. Um, it also has automatic syntax highlighting, which means that when you open an HTML file, for instance, it does see how everything's highlighted here. Like this isn't by default going to happen. But what it's doing is it's trying to give like some semantic credit to like different types of features available within HTML. So like tags here, like my H1 tag is orange. So all tags are orange. So it just kind of lets you read it more easily. Um, but yeah, that is totally the fault of that editor that it's kind of trying to render the HTML. It's a very weird thing. But as you can see with this file, it doesn't do anything special. This is just a .md file. It's like a readme file. You've probably seen this if you played like video games that had readmes. Um, and so this is just some text. So you can see this is very much a GUI. Anyway, so we're gonna make our change. I actually wanna make a more significant page break here. Um, so the way we typically do that is like this. It's like a full tag start and tag end, which in HTML you do with this uh, forward slash. So I'm going to save it and I'm going to quit. In Vim, it's right quit, so WQ. And you'll notice it'll take me back to my like blank terminal. So now we're, we're back to this familiar place. Okay, now if I press, now if I, if I engage the Git application again, Git status. Uh, now we're in an, in, we, we've just like sent this command to the Git application. We've said, hey, check the status for me really quick. And again, uh, relative to the remote repository, when I say repository, I just mean like, place that holds things. Uh, but the place that holds things in my case that I'm interested in is actually, I'm going to quit this, uh, is actually online uh, at this particular URL. Um, so that's the most um, sort of like recent understanding that I have of the code that's hosted on this website. Um, I have a sort of like copy of that, that my local changes that I just made are being compared against. So it's like comparing them against my understanding of the files that are hosted here. And it's saying like, hey, they're different. Like, I think you have a change. So um, what I can do is I can do something I didn't do before, which is this diff. Also, again, you can see those DS store files are being made. That's because I opened this. So the OSX, like operating system makes those files again. And again, also, like I mentioned before, they're hidden. I can't see them in this application, this finder application. Uh, but it is making them. So I can remove them, but I can also just ignore them. Um, but one thing I want to show you is this diff. So what Git's able to do is not only tell me that I have something that's changed, but it can tell me what has changed. Um, so it's showing me that right now here with this view. It's not a very nice view. It's not super informative. Um, but it's informative enough. Basically, what it's saying here is, okay, you did a you did a diff, you did a diff against the previous version of index.html. Um, it's saying that we subtracted lines, and then we added some lines. In this case, we only changed one line. So. This is very high contrast, I'm sorry, but oh, if I highlight it, it makes it better. Specifically, we changed line 14. Um, I think that is. And it's saying that like you, you know, you removed some line, 
you removed a line, but then you added a line, so the line number stayed the same. And it shows us exactly what we did. So the red is what we deleted, and the green is what we added. So that's what changed. Um, I'm OK with that change. Like, that change looks good to me. It's like, great. Um, so I'm going to uh, do another status. I didn't really need to do that because nothing changed, but we can just make sure nothing changed in the background. Um, and I think we're good to go. So what I'm going to do is called a commit. Um, a commit is um, just what it sounds like. It's uh, me saying that I am happy with, um, uh, oh, sorry, before I commit, I can't get ahead of myself. I need to actually add the file to be committed. So I'm not going to get too into this aspect of the Git application itself. I really just wanted to show you how I'm inter interacting with the network with the application. But essentially, you have to propose um, files that you want to add or that you want to commit to the repository before you commit them. So I have to say I want to add index.html to the sort of like list of files that will be committed. So now if I do status again, it says that these changes are going to be committed, right? Changes to be committed. Before it just said changes not staged for commit. So if I had done the following command, here um, with a message. And the message is just like saying, like, it's like a log for me personally to remember sort of like why I did what. Um, if I have a message here, um, if I were to have done this before I added this file, nothing would happen, nothing would change. So that, that's what the whole staging. Uh, staged for commit things. So I'm going to have a message to say changed line break, because that's what that is. I, it's a line break. I'm changing. So I'm going to commit there. It said, OK, one file changed. We made an insertion and a deletion. It's referring to the lines. So I'll do a status again. And it says, hey, like uh, your branch, meaning like your my local files, um, it's different from the origin, which is it's referring to the uh, the web, here, the, the the online hosted version of the code. So you can do a push. Now this is where we're interacting with the network. Like what I'm doing is I'm telling Git the application to send my changes to the remote server. This like isolated moment is like our network interaction. So I'm going to click push. And you can see it talking to the remote here. So it sent this request right here. And it like was successful. So it wrote these objects. Um, and and we're, we're good to go. Uh, you'll notice I did not add the DS store files. I want to ignore them. And because I didn't include that in my add, command, it, it didn't add them. So they didn't get committed. So they're just sitting here on my computer. If I load this page, like you're not going to see the DS store files. But you will see the change to index.html. And if we click it on the website, this is like, this is not trickery or magic. Like, I'm not fooling you. This is, I don't like, I'm not hosting this on my computer. You could visit this URL. It's public. It's a public repository. Anyone can go to it. If you don't believe me, that would be pretty strange conviction, but um, you're welcome to test it uh, and go and you will see that there's this line break, which was added by me from my computer um, through a network request that we submitted to the server. And at this website, this URL, um, you know, GitHub, the the website is hosting some application on their server to like receive these requests. Um, I don't know as much about what that looks like in particular. I've never hosted a Git server, essentially like a Git. I've never hosted a Git repository to receive other people's commits. So I don't know exactly like what what that looks like. Um, 
as far as like setting that up. But as you can imagine, I think like what we talked about last session, we have some clients that are running Git. They talk to a server that manages, handles requests and um, uses Git to um, yeah, manage the files on the remote repository. So yeah, we can see our change here. If I go to the, the website that is sort of represents this project and I refresh it, you can see we got that nice spacing now, which came from our updated page break. Um, yeah, so that, that is like from square one. And I realized we took like the whole time, but uh, I think that's pretty cool. And it's like useful to, um, cause like feasibly, I would say no one is trying to like manage their code with just having an assortment of folders and files that they can't keep track of. And they have no sense of like when they first touched them, like when they first made changes to now. Um, but uh, I know we only have one minute left. I don't know if like uh, people need to like that sort was, of go. Uh, that was great. Um, I mean, maybe for me, if you could just do like a really, really quick summary of, of what we've covered about uh, committing something from the terminal. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, so what we covered was, um, you know, using the terminal as like not really, uh, I, I guess kind of like an alternative to the more conventional way that most of us are used to using a computer, um, which is using the graphical user interface. Um, that's me moving this mouse around. I have these icons, which I can click on to run applications. In the terminal, things are a bit different. We run applications using commands. Um, the way that we build our commands, uh, the way that we uh, create arguments or parameters um, or like options for the commands um, is uh, kind of guided by our shell. So the shell is kind of like the flavor of the interaction that you're going to have with your operating system. Um, if you're using uh, OS X or like uh, a Mac, that flavor is going to be bash. If you're using Windows, uh, it's a bit different. I think it might actually just be called the Windows shell. But um, uh, in any event, this is like sort of the medium for your interaction instead of the uh, screen uh, and the mouse. So in a GUI, you have the screen, the mouse, the buttons on the mouse to click. In the terminal, you kind of have your shell and the commands that you use to build sentences that you want to be executed. Um, we introduced and walked through a couple of different commands like CD, which lets us move to different directories. We can go to the same directory this way. I can go up a couple more this way. Oh, I went all the way up. And I messed something up there. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we can we can move around in folders this way. Um, Um, we can we can list directories so we can like look at the contents of different directories so we kind of introduced a few of those commands and then specifically we got into editing files so I talked about how I use vim which is a text editor um, to edit files um, and when we make modifications to files if we're interested in tracking the changes made Specifically, we're working with code. It can be very useful to use an application like Git, which um, we can use for tracking the changes we've made over time. Um, there are websites that let us host 
uh, the files and code that we modify in Git. Um, the terminal lets us use Git in a command line fashion. Um, again, there's graphical user interfaces for Git, but we're using a terminal uh, application uh, in this case. And uh, I kind of walked us through um, changing some files with a text editor in the terminal, saving the file with changes, and then uh, kind of like reviewing the change that was made and committing that change, which ultimately means um, sending a modification to the files that we're hosting remotely, um, which live here. So if you were to make your own GitHub repository, you would have a username and a repository. And you could likewise um, make changes from the terminal and send them off to uh, a website like this. And to be clear, commit was the only point where a network interaction happened? Sorry, yeah, uh, commit is the one right before. So commit is kind of oh, okay. saying like, if I were to make like the pencil analogy, um, commit is kind of like, um, uh, let's say like if you had an idea in your head and you were like, I think this is a pretty good idea. Commit would be like um, writing it on the paper with the pencil. That's like the commit. Um, but <laughs> if we're talking like really abstract, like that idea is like still just for you. So you can erase it. So it's not permanent yet. But if I give that piece of paper to someone and they read it, that's like get push. So the push, so the push. Okay. yeah, it goes to the server. So that's kind of like giving the piece of paper to your friend. You can't take it back. Like they've seen it now. It's, it's over. Uh, in reality, it's not over. You can like undo stuff. It's not the end of the world uh, in the in Git terms. Uh, but yeah, the commit is kind of like saying like, this is what I'm going to do. Uh, I plan to do this. So the push was the, the moment that I connected with the internet. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's correct through the internet to get. Yes. You can okay. also do a pull. Uh, I don't typically pull because I'm the only one working on this. So I, I don't expect anyone else to be like messing with stuff, you know? Um, so I don't ever have to update my local machine. But that is how I would do that, especially if I was working with other people, like if I was collaborating with you, if you also were changing code, I would want to pull like every time I turned on my computer, if I was going to work on this code to make sure that I have the most recent changes. So I do this git pull and notice here it says already up to date, but it makes a network request and it says like, Hey, uh, let's see if there were any changes uh, since you last uh, did some work. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know we didn't get together too much about the web, but I think we went on a really interesting tangent. That yeah, I think this was essential. I'm really glad, <laughs> really I'm glad, glad to get, this, to yeah, get this fundamental kind of uh, understanding. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, this is pretty like, um, you know, stuff that gets kind of glossed over, I think, when people talk about like learning how to code, but uh, it's interesting because if you decide to sit down and actually do that, I think it can be kind of confounding to just say like, well, how do I, I don't even know where to go to write the code. I don't know like where to, where to put the code when I'm done with it. So, um, but it's also, it's also like, I mean, interacting with the terminal is like interacting. You're still using code. I mean, it's like, yeah. Yeah, you are coding. Yeah, that's right. That's true. Yeah, I didn't think about that. Yeah. Um, and to um, maybe to give a quick resource, um, I'll just say, like, you can search this up. Um, uh, maybe not like a really 
I don't know if you're just going to get like a nice, um, you know, like this is how to use dash from like Wikipedia, but, um, you know, I mean, pretty, you might get a pretty good overview if you check out the Wikipedia entry, but yeah, so this is kind of a bit of what we talked about bash. It's a unit shell and language as we kind of worked on distinguishing there. Um, and you can see it's part of uh, Mac OS. And it looks like, I don't know why it says Mac OS Mojave, because there's one after that. Maybe uh, they dropped it. That'd be kind of weird. I don't know. You can look into that independently if you're interested in that. But um, shells do change over time because some things underpinning the operating system maybe change so much that they decide to um, uh, uh, change things. But uh, yeah, it might talk about Windows a bit here. I think I noticed it said, yeah, so if you see Windows 10, so there's a version of the bash cell available for Windows 10 actually. So um, this is what I was talking about when I was saying like you can use bash on Windows, but there has to be this kind of like exchange happening. That's what this is, this Windows subsystem, I think. Um, yeah, so it allows you to run Linux executables on Windows 10. Um, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, that's kind of maybe uh, some heavier computer stuff than maybe you expected. So, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, super essential. I think it's really good to to cover these things. Um, oh, nice. Cool. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think if uh, if we have if there's nothing if there's no other questions, we can adjourn until next time. Any last words? Thanks a lot. That was really helpful. Yeah. Thank you, Paige. Yeah. And uh, really quick, um, I know maybe some of the I I didn't really get into the Git stuff. But I have a resources page here. Again, this is like accessible to anyone. You can click these two, actually these three, and you can get started very fast with like a web page that looks a lot like this one, like this one literally. Um, but this will kind of give you the basics, kind of take you through what Git is and um, if you're interested in kind of getting started writing code, this is a great way to to get started. So. Cool. All right. Well, I think on that note, we can end. Uh, and uh, you do have uh, the open office hours on Monday at the same time. So. Uh, if anybody wants to do that, that is totally viable and encouraged. Um, and then other than that, we will be meeting again in two weeks to cover more about coding. So uh, thank you very much, Paige. Thank you for being here, Moses. Appreciate uh, it. Yeah. Good night to everybody. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.